In the heart of ancient Germany, a dense, fog-covered forest bore witness to a tale so harrowing, it sent shockwaves throughout the Roman Empire. Three entire Roman legions, led by their ambitious general, marched confidently into the Teutoburg forest, but what awaited them was not glory or conquest, but a meticulously planned ambush. Dive with us into the mystery and intrigue of the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest. Discover a world where nature's wrath, cunning strategy, and the ultimate betrayal combined to craft one of ancient Rome's most devastating and unforgettable defeats. This isn't just a battle, it's a story of pride, deception, and the unpredictable hand of fate. The vast expanse of the Roman Republic saw unprecedented growth during the first century BC, especially under the leadership of Julius Caesar. His conquests spanned Western Europe and even touched the British Isles during the Gallic Wars. While the Gauls were the primary adversaries, the Romans also clashed with various Germanic tribes. Although Caesar ventured twice into the Germanic territories across the Rhine, these expeditions didn't yield decisive outcomes. However, the momentum of Roman expansion was halted due to Caesar's civil war. As a result, continental Europe took a back seat in Roman priorities, especially after troops were withdrawn from Gaul for the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. This vacuum led to a swift Gallic rebellion, with Roman dominance only being restored in 28 BC. In 27 BC, a transformative shift occurred. The Roman Republic transitioned into the Roman Empire, crowning Octavian as its inaugural emperor. Now known as Augustus, he restructured Gaul into three provinces, underscoring the Rhine's strategic significance by stationing troops nearby. Yet, Augustus's stance on the Germanic territories remains a subject of debate. Some argue he wanted the Rhine as a fixed northern boundary, while others believe the boundary was more flexible, with troops primarily ensuring internal stability. Regardless, the Germanic tribes seemed to act freely, as evidenced by the Romans' devastating loss in the Clades Laliana in 16 BC. This setback led to a military overhaul in Gaul by 12 BC intent on subduing the Germanic tribes. Augustus appointed his stepson, Drusus I, as Gaul's governor. Between 11 to 9 BC, Drusus consistently triumphed over the Germans, but his unexpected death and a riding mishap halted the momentum. His elder sibling, the future emperor Tiberius, took over in 8 BC, furthering Roman influence in the region. However, after a falling out, Tiberius opted for self-imposed exile in 6 BC. His successor, Lucius Domitius Ahenobarbus, quelled local revolts and even crossed the Elba, a feat no other Roman general replicated. As the new millennium dawned, the Romans, buoyed by flourishing trade and relative tranquility with the Germans, became complacent about the Germanic territories. In the early days of AD 6, two Roman leaders, Legatus Gaius Sentius Saturninus and Consul Legatus Marcus Emilius Lepidus, marshaled a colossal force. This army, comprising 13 legions, amounted to roughly 100,000 men, which included legionaries, cavalry, archers, and accompanying civilians. Their target was Maribatuus, the ruler of the Marcomanni, a prominent tribe among the Swabi. However, Tiberius's focus was soon diverted to another pressing issue, the Bellum Batonianum, or the Great Illyrian Revolt. This uprising, which erupted in the Balkan province of Illyricum, was spearheaded by leaders like Bato the Decitiate, Bato the Brucian, and Pins of Pannonia, with some involvement from the Marcomanni. The revolt was so significant that Tiberius had to halt his campaign against Maribatuus, acknowledge his kingship, and redirect eight of his legions to suppress the Balkan rebellion. Meanwhile, Arminius, after returning from Rome, positioned himself as a trusted aide to Varus. Yet, behind the scenes, he was orchestrating a grand alliance of Germanic tribes, many of whom had historically been at odds. This coalition likely encompassed tribes like the Cherusci, Marci, Chatti, and Bructory, among the 50 Germanic tribes of that era. Capitalizing on the resentment against Varus' oppressive rule and cruelty, Arminius managed to rally these tribes under a unified banner, biding his time for the perfect moment to strike. With the bulk of the Roman legions dispatched to the Balkans, only three remained to confront the Germanic tribes. This strategic imbalance presented Arminius with a golden opportunity to challenge Varus. 
As Varus moved his troops from their summer encampment towards their winter base near the Rhine, he received misleading reports of a minor rebellion, masterfully fabricated by Arminius. Historian Edward Shepard Creasy noted that Varus was led to believe this was a minor disturbance, remaining oblivious to the larger, coordinated uprising brewing. He still perceived Arminius as a loyal subject, unaware of the impending betrayal. Publius Quintilius Varus, the central figure of the Varian disaster, was a Roman commander with a storied past. At a young age, he was handpicked by Emperor Augustus for the position of Quester in 22 BC, a role typically reserved for those over 30. His leadership journey saw him at the helm of the 19 Legion by 15 BC, and later as the junior consul. His governance extended to Africa in 8 BC and Syria in 7 BC, the latter being a particularly challenging role due to the political intricacies of the Eastern Empire. In Syria, Varus adeptly navigated the succession crisis following Herod the Great's death in 4 BC, however, opinions on his governance varied, while Josephus painted a favorable picture, Valius Paterculus hinted at possible corruption. Nevertheless, Varus's marriage to the emperor's great-niece solidified his position within the imperial inner circle. By 7 AD, he was appointed to oversee Germania, not necessarily for his military prowess, but, as historian McNally suggests, for his political savvy to navigate the complex tribal politics of Germania. Varus's reputation extended beyond Roman borders, primarily due to his brutal suppression of revolts, often resorting to crucifixions. While this instilled fear among the masses, it earned him respect within the Roman Senate. Stationed on the Rhine, he commanded the 17, 18, and 19 legions, succeeding General Gaius Sentius Saturninus. The remaining legions at Castrum Moguntiacum were under the leadership of Varus's nephew, Lucius Nonius Asprinus, and possibly Lucius Arunchus. Initially, Varus had five legions and their auxiliaries in Germania. Each legion, during this period, comprised about 4,800 soldiers, 120 cavalry scouts, engineers, officers, and around 1,200 non-combatant servants. This meant Varus's initial force, excluding auxiliaries, represented a significant portion of the Roman frontline army. However, the exact number of troops at the Teutoburg Forest battle remains debated, with estimates ranging from 20,000 to 30,000. By the time of the battle, only three of his original legions remained, weakened by winter attrition and the need to establish garrisons en route. Historian McNally estimates the total force, including civilians and non-combatants, to be around 21,000 at the campaign's onset, a number likely reduced by the battle time. The primary Roman force was a state-funded, professional unit equipped with standardized weapons and armor. This included the gladius, a shield, pilum, helmet, mail shirt, and segmented armor. In contrast, the auxiliary units, representing their native regions, were equipped similarly to the Germanic troops they faced. Arminius, the mastermind behind the Germanic coalition that confronted the Romans, hailed from the Cherusci tribe. His life story is a blend of Germanic roots and Roman upbringing. Captured by the Romans after Drusus's victory over the Cherusci in 8 BC, a young Arminius was whisked away to Rome. Given his noble lineage, he was educated in the aristocratic traditions of the Romans. As he matured, he joined the Ordo Equester, the Roman cavalry, eventually ascending to command Roman auxiliaries. By 4 AD, he was stationed in Pannonia, only to return to Germania, ostensibly as a Roman ally historian McNally posits that Arminius's perspective on the Romans was profoundly influenced by two pivotal events, a Cherusci ambush on Drusus in 11 BC and Drusus's subsequent triumph in 8 BC the former showcased the Romans' vulnerability, while the latter was a personal affront to Arminius, leading to his captivity. McNally believes Arminius deduced that Romans could be vanquished if their tactical prowess was neutralized. Quantifying Arminius's forces is challenging due to the absence of Germanic written records. Estimates fluctuate. Adrian Murdoch proposes 25,000. Peter Wells speculates anywhere from 17,000 to a staggering 100,000, with 18,000 being probable during the Romans' final defeat. McNally critiques Wells's calculations, deeming the upper limit implausible. 
Hans Delbruck theorizes that each participating tribe could muster 6,000 to 8,000 warriors, totaling 20,000 to 30,000. Delbruck emphasizes that these weren't mere peasants, but seasoned warriors. However, their equipment paled in comparison to the Romans. The majority possessed rudimentary gear, a basic shield, and perhaps a spear or axe. Equipment quality was stratified by the warrior's wealth and rank. Elite fighters, those in command or part of a chieftain's retinue, were better armed with heavy spears, javelins, and superior shields. Armor, however, was a rarity, often acquired from fallen Romans or perhaps during stints as Roman auxiliaries. The rhythm of ancient warfare was dictated by nature's ebb and flow. Campaigns typically commenced in March and wrapped up by October, after which armies retreated to their winter encampments. During the winter transition from 8 to 9 AD, Varus charted a straightforward campaign for the upcoming season. The plan was to assemble the army at Vetera, traverse the Rhine, journey to Cherusai territory, replenish garrisons en route, and then establish a summer base in the ostensibly subdued Cherusai region to anchor their summer operations. However, lurking in the shadows was a plot Varus was oblivious to. The proposal to pitch a summer camp deep in Cherusai territory was a ruse masterminded by Arminius, who, at this point, was still perceived as a loyal ally by Varus. Stationing the Romans in Arminius's homeland allowed the Cherusai to discreetly monitor their activities. Moreover, the Romans' return to their winter base would necessitate a lengthier journey, making them vulnerable to ambushes and terrains advantageous to Arminius. The exact moment Arminius resolved to betray Rome remains shrouded in mystery. It could have been during his hostage days, or perhaps even during his tenure under Varus in Germania. What's clear is that by early 9 AD, Arminius was actively deceiving Varus and rallying Germanic leaders to his side. Given the might of the Roman forces, it's unlikely Arminius anticipated a swift victory. Assembling a coalition of tribes was crucial, preparing for what might have been a drawn-out conflict. As spring dawned in March, the Roman army, following Varus's blueprint, embarked from their winter encampments. However, their journey was marred by logistical hiccups and a concerning lack of security. While the exact location of their summer base remains uncertain, it's believed to have been situated around present-day Minden, Germany. Historical records hint that Varus's summer was largely peaceful, with his attention pivoting towards diplomatic and administrative dealings with the Germanic tribes. Yet, historian McNally questions the reliability of these accounts, noting that the primary source, Paterculus, had personal biases against Varus, which might have influenced subsequent narratives. Regardless, the Roman troops likely spent their summer in routine activities, such as drills and infrastructure projects. For Arminius, the summer was a ticking clock. While embedded with the Roman army as part of the auxiliaries, he meticulously plotted his ambush. By July, he initiated his scheme, directing some allies to raid Roman territories. He then advised Varus to dispatch a troop detachment to quell the disturbances, effectively dividing the Roman forces. Arminius's audacity extended to having his Cherusai auxiliaries approach Roman work groups under the guise of normalcy, only to betray them once they were within striking distance. McNally criticizes Varus for his oversight, failing to bolster security or discern the larger conspiracy at play. However, Arminius's intricate web of deception was on the brink of exposure when suggests his father-in-law tipped off Varus about the impending betrayal. But Varus dismissed the warning, possibly attributing Suggest's claims to familial animosity stemming from his disapproval of Arminius's marriage to his daughter. As the waning days of summer approached, the Roman army grappled with mounting disturbances. Some of Varus's advisors cautioned against engaging in any major campaign, given the limited time left in the season to both suppress the unrest and return to their winter encampment. Following this strategy would have inadvertently thwarted Arminius's plans, as the Romans would have retreated along their familiar, fortified route. In a bold move, Arminius proposed an alternative, a campaign against the Angravaria. This route, he argued, would not only be shorter but would also allow the Romans to quell the rebellion. Perhaps the monotonous summer made Varus more receptive to action, and he decided to heed Arminius's advice. On September 7, 9 AD, 
the Roman army assembled, ready to march. This day also coincided with the third payday of the year, leading to a significant distribution of coins among the troops. This concentration of coins would later serve as a significant archaeological indicator of the battle's location. The soldiers' spirits were further buoyed by the promise of loot during the Angravarii campaign, as they would be operating beyond their regular supply chains. As dusk approached, Arminius informed Varus of his intention to rally the Cherusii auxiliaries and promised to rejoin the main army within a few days. This marked their last interaction. While Arminius left a handful of Cherusii behind, ostensibly as guides, their real mission was espionage. Arminius's departure significantly reduced the Roman army's size and severely hampered its reconnaissance capabilities. Meanwhile, Arminius hastened north to rally the Angravarii and Bructory forces. As dawn broke on September 8th, the Roman army, already navigating through dense forests, found their progress further hindered, causing the army to stretch out over an even longer distance. Arminius, with his meticulous planning, aimed to guide the Romans towards Cochres, where the Angravarii awaited an ambush. To ensure this, the Bertirii, allies of Arminius, launched an attack on the elongated Roman line by late morning. The Roman procession, now extended between 15 and 20 kilometers, was suddenly assailed by Germanic warriors wielding swords, lances, and short spears known as Freemi. The Germanic forces encircled the Romans, showering them with javelins. This skirmish, though brief, was strategic, aiming to exhaust the Romans and damage their supplies. The Bracterii then retreated, likely taking with them the embedded Cherusii spies. To compound the Romans' woes, a heavy downpour ensued. Varus, recognizing the futility of advancing, ordered the establishment of a fortified camp and convened a war council. Initial reports indicated minimal casualties, but highlighted the vulnerability of their baggage trains and scout cavalry. In a desperate bid to escape, the Romans embarked on a nocturnal march, only to fall into another of Arminius's traps at Cochrane's Hill. The terrain, with its narrow passage between the hill and the Great Bog, was further obstructed by a trench and an earthen wall, allowing the Germanic forces to ambush the Romans from concealed positions. The Romans' attempt to breach the wall was futile. In the ensuing chaos, Legatus Pneumonius Valla fled with the cavalry, only to be pursued and killed by the Germanic cavalry. The Germanic forces then descended upon the field, massacring the disoriented Romans. Varus took his own life, and other Roman officers followed suit or were captured and later killed. The Roman losses were staggering, estimated at 15,000 to 20,000. Tacitus noted that many Roman officers were subjected to Germanic religious rites, while others were ransomed or enslaved. The archaeological evidence from Cochrane, with its plethora of Roman artifacts and scant Germanic remains, underscores the scale of the Roman defeat. However, the Germanic practice of burying warriors with their gear and the use of perishable materials in their armor might explain the lack of Germanic relics. Following this monumental victory, the Germanic tribes eradicated all Roman establishments east of the Rhine. The remaining Roman legions, under Lucius Nonius Asprinus, focused on defending the Rhine. The fort of Aliso, believed to be in present-day Halton MC, resisted the Germanic onslaught for an extended period. Eventually, under Lucius Caedicius, the garrison, along with Teutoburg survivors, broke the siege and reached the Rhine. Their resilience allowed Nonius Asprinus and Tiberius to fortify the Rhine defenses, preventing Arminius from invading Gaul. The catastrophic defeat at the Teutoburg Forest sent shockwaves throughout the Roman Empire. Emperor Augustus, upon learning of the calamity, was profoundly affected. The Roman historian Suetonius, in his work The Twelve Caesars, recounts that the emperor was so distraught that he would often bang his head against the palace walls, exclaiming in anguish, Quintilius Verus, give me back my legions. In a symbolic gesture reflecting the magnitude of the loss, the Roman Empire never again used the legion numbers 17, 18, and 19, even though other legions that suffered defeats were later reconstituted. The Teutoburg disaster marked a halt to the Roman Empire's era of expansion, which had seen unbroken successes since the conclusion of the civil wars four decades prior. 
Tiberius, Augustus' stepson, assumed the reins and readied the empire for the continuation of hostilities. To bolster the Roman forces, Legio II Augusta, XX Valeria Victrix, and 13 Gemina were dispatched to the Rhine, replacing the legions lost in the battle. In a move to consolidate his power and perhaps form a united front against Rome, Arminius sent the severed head of Varus to Maribodus, the king of the Marcomanni and another dominant Germanic leader. He proposed an alliance against the Romans. However, Maribodus declined the offer. Instead of joining forces with Arminius, he sent Varus's head to Rome for a proper burial, choosing to remain neutral. It was only after this episode that tensions escalated between Arminius and Maribodus, leading to a brief and inconclusive conflict between the two Germanic chieftains. Thank you for watching this episode of History Uncovered. The tale of the Teutoburg Forest and its reverberations through the Roman Empire is a testament to the unpredictable nature of history. If you found this video informative and engaging, please like and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating stories from the past. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications so that you never miss a new video. We're dedicated to bringing you captivating tales and insights from various epics, and your support helps us delve deeper into history's vast tapestry. Based on the algorithm's recommendation, there's another video on the screen that you might find intriguing. Check it out and continue your journey through time with us.